Well, good morning. Good morning. So, um, we should be forming uh, teams, project teams now. And uh, it looks like there are one, two, three, four, five, five teams. And I think everybody's on a team except for a couple of people. Let's see. So, the cooling tower, got five people. Heat pump, water heater needs three. So, wait a minute, that's, uh, we can get four on that, right? So, the heat pump, water heater, so that's 21 acres. So that's Matt, Kurt, Manu, and, uh, and, and and we could get one more person if you're not on a, if you're not on a team. Um, so the heat pump water heater, then the piping and instrumentation diagram, that's full, that's four students. That's also 21 acres post harvest refrigeration, that's full. Um, and UW efficiency uh, calculations, efficiency analysis that is uh, that that can use one student so there are two unassigned students it looks like um, one for the UW Bothell project and another for 21 acres okay and uh, I don't want to just I don't want to name names but the, the students who are signed up, well, I don't want to call out anybody that's not signed up, but, the, but I've got Francis, Arden, Shelby, Dang, and Faisal in the cooling tower project. And uh, heat pump water heater is Matt, Kurt, and Manu. Piping and instrumentation um, is uh, Robert Huggins, Mitchell, Kim's run and Logan. And the post harvest refrigeration is Daniel, Tanner, Brian, and Tyler. It's that table, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, and then uh, the UW efficiency calculation Christian, Shaylin, Faisal, and Louie. And uh, so two of you have not uh, signed up. So if you're looking for a, a team, uh, so we've got heat pump water heater and uh, so let's see, who's, who's uh, let's see, Kurt, Matt, who, who's, who's the team leader, Kurt, Kurt are you, you who, who's the point person for that one? Can you be point person, so uh, Matt, um, yeah, if anybody here wants, you're looking for a project uh, and you want to do heat pump water heater, Matt's your, your guy to snag. And then if you want to uh, work on the UW efficiency uh, analysis, there, uh, let's see, you've got Christian, Shaylin, one, two, three, four. Who's, uh, does anybody volunteer to be? I'll take it. Uba, Grant, Uba, <laughs> Christian, you can I guess. Grant, Uba there. So yes. Christian's your guy, you want to talk to Christian yes, or Shailen or direct their complaints. Faisal, yeah, direct your complaints to, uh, well, I'm, I'm usually the person that, she what? Oh, she did, oh, okay, okay, so I'll, uh, okay, gosh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure who the yeah, Even though you're on the team. Well, last person, okay. well, go ahead. Yeah, everybody signed it. Okay, so what you, you need to do, you should do it as quickly as you can, is, is make a contact with, uh, with your, uh, the, the, the person, uh, the sponsor. And uh, let's see, I, I moved down. Projects, uh, Tammy Cox. 
is the key person there. And the, uh, So do you, you will be on the efficiency? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay, I'll add you to that. Let me do that right now. Cox Tam. Make a call? Yes. I'll just make a group chat real quick. So I think she's the key contact person. And the other guy with her, I think that's her. Uh, one of them is the manager. One is the, I think he was. Supervisor. Supervisor. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and his name is uh, Rashan. It's kind of an unusual last name. The X is silent. Lee, Lee Rashan Lee. And his uh, email address is guy. And then for uh, 21, 21 acres, Kelly Rankish. Uh, Rand Kell, I think. Is it Rand Kell? Uh, Kelly, Kelly R. Kelly R. Twenty one acres work. And uh, especially for you 21 acres folks, if you, if, you, uh, if, if you plan to go out there, and you should try to set up a time to go out and see the site. Well, I mean, you pretty much have to do that at least once, probably two or three times. But uh, I'll be happy to go with you uh, or meet you there if you want me to, or if it's a time you're going to go, which pretty much means it has to be a Tuesday, Thursday, or a Friday. But uh, I don't have to be there if you want me to. I always love to go there. It's a fun place to look around and just see, you know, HVAC stuff, and especially heat pump related stuff. And uh, and then uh, for the UW uh, physical plant, we have a tour uh, for this Friday. And this this Friday is is going to be what the sixth. Friday, May sixth. Physical plant is uh, right across the. Uh, is what's right over there, beside the uh, South Parking Garage. But what we can do, what I'd like to do is, um, it's at 11:45, and I know a lot of you. I think a lot of you are in the uh, at the prep. Not, not all of you, but some of you are in the at the prep class, and that's over at 11:30. And what I'll, what we can do is meet there in that room, and I'll go over there at about 11.30, and uh, we'll, we'll meet. So that's, uh, that's at UW10, remember the name, is it 040? I think it's 04. This is, yeah, that sounds right to me. I think I can. Yeah, it's 040. Uh, zero okay. Zero four zero. So we at zero four zero, you know, after uh, at the prep. So that that would be about eleven thirty. So I'll just go down there and we can meet and walk over together. Or, or you know, if you want to just walk over by yourself, that's fine too. Uh, you know where to go. It's it's uh yeah, I think we'll probably go in the front, the main entrance, which is the front of the building. And they have a reception desk and you know people that handle maintenance. But the actually the entrance to the HVAC areas in the back in the lower level. But I don't think they would want us to go in that way. That's like where the cooling towers are. And uh, but anyway, uh, so Friday, eleven forty-five, and um, yeah, so they're gonna show us around and 
should be pretty, pretty interesting to see the chillers and all the piping and the pumps and compressors and things like that. And then, uh, any questions about the projects or getting getting started? Um, I know it's it's a pain to have to you know work with other you, know, you have to connect with somebody and coordinate. But I, I really, you know, I I, I, I really like practical in the field stuff. It's really uh, at some point you need to get out of textbooks and you know, kind of textbook problems. Go out and see how this stuff works and what it's like and what it feels like, you know, the pumps and, and the refrigeration units and, and the ducts and to see everything happen. And it gives you a, a really a, I mean, that's really when the reality sets in. You know, this is each this stuff really does work. Um, I remember that when I had my intern, the, the engineering was just theory to me, it was just textbook stuff through my junior year. And then between my junior and senior year, I had an internship where I worked in a manufacturing plant, a huge manufacturing plant. It was several football fields. And uh, I mean, it was just so loud. You had to have you know ear protection and things like that, and eye protection. But you know, just pulling out there, all of a sudden, everything I was doing just started to make sense, and it became real. And I, I remember what really hit me was feeling what was happening, the, the, the feeling of of uh, uh, fluids moving through, you know, enormous quantities of fluids moving through pipes, and steam. I work a lot with steam and steam heating, uh, machinery, and just the heat and uh, the moisture in the air, and the, you know, hearing valves open in air, and all of that. Just uh, it's like, wow, this, this is really cool. You know, I got my because this all seemed like math, you know, like tor slow torture by math, and then suddenly. All this cool stuff and valves opening and stuff turning on and off and you don't know when stuff is, you know the sequencing of, of things uh, you push a button and then uh, uh, press, things happen I, I love that kind of stuff we'll, we'll do that when we get to the controls part. that's my favorite part of uh, not just the HVAC but of all the of engineering is controlling the process so the operator you, know, you set it up the operator pushes a button and then everything just turns on in the right sequence it starts up and goes to steady state. And uh, yeah, then it's time for vacation. The operator pushes the stop button. It all shuts down you know, just perfectly. That's, that's, that, that's like my dream engineering. And um, uh, it seems to be dying. I mean, I mean manufacturing is, uh, well, it's still around, but it's just not as, uh, it doesn't seem like as many engineers do it as they used to. But anyway, uh, yeah, so, uh, OK, so today I want to, uh, I want to pick up where we left off last time and do some practice with uh, air, uh, with, with, with air distribution, and then I want to do water, move into water distribution in the second hour. Very similar, except you know, one we're moving air, the other we're moving water, but we're still working, you know, with fluid mechanics and the the, uh, the equations, the Bernoulli equation still applies. I think uh, maybe the big difference. For me, is when we're dealing with water, we have to be mindful of elevation change, uh, changes in the in the el uh, the elevation head of the Bernoulli equation. That's generally irrelevant with air because you can pump. I mean, you can move air great vertical distances because air is not dense. It's it doesn't really add energy, or we don't really need energy to push move air upward. We need energy to push it through friction in the system. But when we're moving water around, even a 10-foot change in elevation, you know, that, that's a significant energy. Because water is dense, liquids are much more dense. So we have to take the elevation into account. Um, we also have to deal with uh, net positive suction head, which is always a, an ugly monster lurking in the background that can bite us if we're not really careful. The, uh, the net positive suction head, if you don't have it going into the pump, the liquid vaporizes, and you absolutely do not want your liquid, you don't want water turning into water vapor before it goes into the pump, because then you're going to have bad things happen. Cavitation, um, I don't know, did you do that, did you do suction head, that positive suction head in fluid mechanics, does that ring a bell? Yep. Because um, we'll, we'll do it here, and, uh, and also just 
you know, becoming familiar with the practical side of, of fluid mechanics, being able to uh, quickly calculate friction head and pump head, how much pump head do you need, and then using that to uh, estimate the power requirement and choose a motor that will drive the pump or the fan. Um, so with, the, with, with, with liquids, we've got the elevation to consider. And then with air, uh, moving air around, uh, a big headache uh, it, are, are the fittings. Dealing with fittings is just a pain. Doing that manually, you know, now it's all computerized. Actually, most of what we're doing now is, is in software. You just dial in your design. You know, I need a, uh, you have to specify exactly what fitting you want, and where in your design, and the software will pull out all of the, uh, you know, if it's an equivalent length, more likely it will be a, uh, a K factor, a loss coefficient, and it'll calculate all that for you. You don't have to go looking things up. The, the duct fitting data, especially the ash rate data, is just miserable. It's just awful to use. So I don't use it uh, unless I absolutely have to. I use equivalent lengths or I use other ways of estimating um, what, what, the, what the duct fitting losses are. It's a lot easier with liquid, uh, with, with water flow fittings, with uh, moving liquids around tend to be more standardized and they're not as many uh, variables that affect the, the loss. It's just, you know, I've got an elbow. It's a 90 degree elbow, so it has this K factor. The problem with air and ducts, with a, a duct elbow, is you have to know the radius of the duct, you have to know the radius of the curve of the elbow, different elbows curve differently. Uh, you need to know the velocity going into the elbow, the velocity coming out. And things like T's and, 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 and Y uh, 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 fittings are, are, are real, a real pain to have to deal with um, if you don't have the software. But anyway, that's, that's really the, the, the major uh, differences. Apart from the, the problem with the fittings, uh, air is probably easier to, to do, the, uh, you know, do a fluid analysis of, of the, uh, and analyze the system. Um, and there are a number of ways that we can uh, design a duct layout system. Um, if, we're, if we have a, a computer, typically nowadays we use um, what's called the static regain method. And we're not gonna do that because we don't have the computers to do that for us here. But when we're doing it by hand, the equal friction method is the standard technique where you just assume you're gonna have constant loss through the whole ductwork system. And, and typically, we assume 0.1 uh, inches of water per 100 feet of, of duct, um, or 0.15, um, that's very common now. And, uh, or or we, we calculate what the, uh, we, 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 we determine a velocity at the fan uh, we know the velocity in the CFM at the fan, we can calculate the pressure uh, or the, the head loss there, and we just make that constant through the whole system, and we can do our design uh, in that manner. And that's the example in my notes, and, and the homework problem has, uh, uses, that, uh, uses that approach. Um, so I'm going to switch over to uh, pick up my, my notes from uh, la last time. Oh, I wanted to... Thing here. Oh, shoot. Ah, I turned it off. I'm having trouble with these things in both, both classes. Is that? Yeah, my heat transfer, this thing is like stuck. It's parked in front of the board, and I can't use the whiteboard. That's a real pain. Oh. Our, our book has a, has a diagram something like this, but it's really a, it's a nice visualization of what is happening in a, in a duct system.
And uh, so here's, a, here's our duct work here. And uh, we're showing the return air. So this is drawing air out of the room. And uh, this is, so the suction side of the fan is drawing it into the fan through a filter. Then the fan pushes it out over the heating and the cooling coils. And then it divides up and, and goes to the various spaces as the supply air. Uh, and, and this is nice because it shows the pressure changes as you, uh, as you work your way through the system. You know, starting with, you know, just regular roof uh, atmospheric pressure. Now this is gauge pressure here. So gauge pressure means that uh, it zeroes out at atmospheric pressure, whatever the pressure in the room is, uh, that's, that's zero. And then the, the measured pressures in the system are measured relative to the pressure in the, in the space surrounding air. As you can see, you get sucked into the return duct here at atmospheric pressure, and then you go below atmospheric pressure to get on the suction side of the fan. You know, so the fan is pulling the air through, so the, uh, the gauge pressure becomes more negative. It's below atmospheric pressure, um, and then it gets uh, it's just drawn through the filter, and it's going to lose, there's going to be pressure drop across the filter. Um, and nowadays, actually nowadays, because of uh, COVID and fires, uh, we're starting to specify more efficient filters, filters that uh, take out more particulate, finer particulate, and uh, that's much higher pressure drops, like uh, the, the, the uh, MERV 11, MERV 12, MERV 13 filters are now recommended with, instead of the MERV 6 or 7. That, I was using them until a couple of years ago. And then you get into HEPA filters for hospitals and things like that. Those are really highly efficient, but they also have very high pressure drop. And you have to make sure to factor that into your design. You know, you've got a filter like that. Um, and, and you have to get that information really from a manufacturer. Um, so we go through the filter, and then you get sucked into the fan. And the fan, what, the, what a fan does is it gives you pressure. Uh, that's its main job, is to give you uh, a sufficient pressure so that you can overcome all the friction in the system. So the air is able to push its way through and out to the spaces. So you can see big increase in pressure, uh, going negative up to positive. Uh, and then you immediately start to drop as you move through, especially the coils here. Those are you know, the filter and the heating and cooling coils, this is probably where you have the greatest pressure losses because you're, you've got things that are just disrupting the flow. The air has to push around. You know, lots of little tubes here that have hot water or cold water or refrigerant. And, uh, and then you come out with your nice conditioned air, and then you move through. Then your losses are just friction losses through this straight sections of duct, um, but in each of the fittings here, you're going to have more loss. So this is actually showing the effect of the, uh, the elbows here, but these are going to have steeper losses than just the straight runs of the duct, and then you're going to have a big drop off in pressure. Uh, whatever, the, uh, when you come out uh, at the, 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 the diffuser here and in the room, you're going to come down however far you have to come to get to atmospheric pressure here. So that's kind of a neat way of visualizing. But one thing we don't see here is uh, the effect of what's, what's called static regain. And that happens when you have a, when you have an expansion or a contraction in the flow, when that happens, the pressure the total pressure continues to go down, and that's what's showing here is total pressure. But when you squeeze the flow, when you constrict the flow, you increase the velocity. So the velocity head rises. And because that's rising, you're, 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 you're increasing the kinetic energy. Uh, you have to, that has to come from another part of the energy. So it comes from the pressure energy. Uh, so the pressure falls, the velocity increases, and uh, the static pressure falls. Um, that's what happens when you constrict the flow. When you expand the flow, the opposite happens. You, the static pressure will increase, and the velocity head, the velocity pressure goes down. 
Uh, by static regain, what that means is that you're, you're, uh, you're expanding the flow to allow the static pressure to, uh, to come up. You're trading off the velocity head for static head. Um, and uh, the point here being that in, in, in any system, or what any uh, air distribution system, we've got a total pressure, which is the sum of the velocity pressure and the static pressure, where the velocity pressure is one half times the density times the velocity squared. But if we're working with uh, in English units, where velocity is in feet per minute, and the density is, uh, the air is at 68 degrees, or 60 degrees, 60, 60 degrees, 68 degrees, then this just becomes uh, V velocity squared, uh, velocity, I'm going to write it this way, velocity over 4,005 squared. And that will give us uh, the velocity head or velocity pressure in inches of water. Inches of water. So this is, uh, at least in our, on the air side, this is the equation that we typically use. In fact, we use it so often that it's just one of those equations that gets buried in memory. You know, uh, each got the velocity head v squared over 4,005 squared. Um, and then the static head, this is so this is the head, this is what you need to get velocity. How, how fast do you want your air coming off the fan? And then this is the energy required to overcome friction loss. So the sum is the total pressure, and that's what the fan has to deliver. Um, and then when we get the pumps and water flow, we have to add the elevation head, which is the energy that you need to push the liquid up a vertical distance, but we don't worry about that with the air. I don't even think we worry about that, like moving air up a really tall building. Actually, these calculations do get really interesting with tall buildings, especially with water. Uh, if you've got water moving around, you know, a hundred, a hundred story building, uh, that's a massive amount of elevation head. Uh, so if you're, your liquid piping at the lower floors is connected to the liquid piping at the upper floors, your lower floor piping is going to be really thick wall. So you have to really force to withstand all of that force of uh, gravity that's <laughs> pushing down. Um, okay, so uh, that's kind of a, a nice way. And our textbook has a, a similar diagram. I, I think it's a better diagram probably because it shows that it breaks the total down into the static and velocity. I've also seen this show up in FE exam questions in the fluid mechanics part. We'll put something like this and then ask, uh, ask some, some questions. So it's, I don't know why that's a. You did fluids last week, right? Fluid uh, review in FE? Yeah. Okay. Um, That's actually a good, uh, the, the FE fluid mechanics is, uh, it, it's very, I, the, the, the focus of the FE exam is very practical. It's very hands-on fluid stuff, not theoretical. Not the Stokes equation type stuff. Okay, so uh, let me draw up here. We'll, we'll, uh, let's see, we were looking at Yeah, you know, the basic uh, equations, applying the Bernoulli equation to an air, the air distribution system. And uh, what we want to do here is uh, we want to calculate what our, our friction loss is, which is uh, the, the, the losses due to friction in the ducts and friction in the, uh, in the fittings. from the straight ducts, this is from the fittings. And uh, 
and we use those in the extended Bernoulli equation to calculate our pump head, or our fan head, in this case, pump head, fan head. Uh, this is the pressure that the fan has to supply in order for the air to overcome friction in the system, both in the straight runs of duct as well as the fittings. We multiply that by the, um, the flow rate and uh, we should look at this form here. For air, we use the total pressure. So this would be the sum of the velocity head and the static head multiplied by CFM. And, uh, and then this is a conversion factor. It gives us the air horsepower. This is the energy or the rate at which we have to add energy to the air so the air moves through the system and it gets delivered to the space at the required CFM. Um, and eventually, this is, uh, this is where our design is leading up to. We're laying out our ductwork system, and we're, we're, we're uh, uh, tallying up all the pressure drops through the system, and then when we get to the end, we calculate what our fan horsepower requirement has to be. Um, So I want to move down here and, and look at how we actually size this, this system, how we, how we uh, figure out what the, uh, the size of the ducts have to be. And uh, this is the equal friction method that we use. And uh, the idea here is to maintain a constant pressure loss per unit length of duct through the system. It's typically 0.1 or 0.15. Um, I think some energy codes now are starting to mandate uh, a maximum friction loss through the system of around 0.1 or 0.15 because uh, the higher that number is, the more energy the system is going to use to drive the fan. And, uh, and then there's a, a kind of a little recipe here to how we apply the equal friction method. And typically we start out by choosing a velocity coming off our fan based on the type of system that we have. Now this is kind of an old fashioned approach, an older approach, it's starting to be replaced by, we just take a pressure loss. We say, uh, it's gonna be 0.1, and that's gonna be my starting point, it's 0.1 feet of, uh, 0.1 inches of water per 100 feet of duct. So then everything uh, gets designed according to that. But I still like to think about well, what do I have here, and what is the typical feet per minute coming off my fan. And I know what the CFM is because I've already done my psychometric analysis. So I figured out what my supply air condition has to be, right? We know what the Q is, QS, right? We already did that. So we know our CFM. Now I want to know, okay, how fast do I need to push this CFM through my duct work? Usually it's going to be between 1,000 and 2,000 feet per minute, maybe 900 feet per minute. And you can sort of see that range here. Um, but it varies depending on the size of the ducts and the type of, 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 of buildings. So a residence, you know, maybe small ducts is common. 600 feet per minute would be a nice kind of starting point for your velocity. Uh, so once you know that velocity and the CFM, you've got two parameters. Now you can use your ductilator or you can use the tables and find out what, the, what that pressure loss is going to be. And that becomes the pressure loss through the whole system. Right, and uh, and then once we find that out, we um, then we can we size that initial duct, that duct that, that comes off the fan, and uh, and then we just go through each branch in the network, and every time we we pull off a, a branch, right, some CFM goes off to the branch, and then we're left, you know, we have the remaining CFM, and then we we size that uh, the next duct run based on that new CFM, and you just keep going until you get to the end, and then you dump in the air into the space. Um, so we determine the duct size for the main supply. After each branch, we reduce the CFM by the amount that goes off into each branch. And then we have to find a new velocity and a new duct size that keeps the friction loss the same. So the friction loss staying constant all the way through. 
And the key point here, once we've done all of this for the entire system, we have to analyze the run. We have to find the run that has the greatest pressure loss. Okay, so we have multiple paths from the fan to atmospheric. So here I can go uh, this way, I can go that way, I can go this way. I have three paths from the fan to atmospheric pressure, so one, two, and three. I have to sum the pressure losses through all of those, find out which one is the greatest, and then that becomes the one I designed to. That becomes the one I, I size my fan for. Okay? And then what I'll do is I'll put dampers in the other runs and adjust those dampers to equalize the pressure. Okay. Often it's obvious which run is going to be the run that has the largest pressure. It's going to be the longest run. It's going to be the run that has the highest number of hittings, 90 degree turns, and things like that. Um, but generally, you want to you want to check them all out, which I didn't do in this problem. I wish I, I did, because actually, you know, th this run turns out to be kind of looking at it. You can see that's going to be the critical run that has the highest pressure. So it's going to be A, B, C. But this has the highest pressure only because of the, uh, the T here gives this greater loss than, uh, than, than this run uh, over here. So you want to kind of go through and do all of them, unless it's really obvious which one has the, the highest loss. Um, so if you go through this example here, you know, lay, lay it out step by step. So you have a duct run, a duct duct system for a theater, and there's some information about the fittings, the equivalent lengths for the elbows, 12 times the diameter of the duct, and then the branching T, the branching T here, has a loss coefficient of 1.5. And then pressure each outlet must be 0.15, so that, uh, that would be the pressure to go through the diffuser to go out of the duct and into the space. And then we just disregard all the other stuff, simplicity here. And we want to find what, what is the total pressure that the fan must supply and, and the power of the fan. So we've got part of the equation right here, 4,000 CFM. That's the total amount of air we've got to move. We need 800 CFM in that space, 2,000 here, and 1,200 there. And they sum up the 4,000. And, you know, I think the codes now want me to start out by just saying, all right, I'm just going to, you know, I'm not even going to think of velocity here. I'm going to start with the pressure loss. I'm just going to say it's got to be 0.1 or 0.15 inches of water per 100 feet. I'm still not used to that, so I look up first what the velocity should be. Uh, so the table says, for a theater, the supply duct velocity is 1,600 FPM. So that gives me a starting point, 1,600 feet per minute, 4,000 CFM coming off the fan. And now I use a ductilator. Um, have you all had a chance to play around with the ductilator? Yes. So you just line up, you line up uh, 4,000 CFM, so in the red area, the outer ring is CFM, so 4,000 CFM, you put that up against 1,600 feet per minute, And that tells me I need a 21 inch duct. If it's a round duct, so the duct diameter is 21 inches. And then in the blue friction loss window, this tells me I go to the blue window now at 4,000 CFM, 0 0.15, 0 0.17, or 0 0.18, 0 0.17. That's a little high, actually. I, I, you know, nowadays I might want to, I might want to go to a lower, I might want to go to a bigger duct, drop that pressure down a little bit. But for now, we'll take that 0.17. So you got a trade-off here. Bigger ducts are expensive. Duct work is expensive. You get a lot of it. Um, so you got a trade-off here. Big ducts give you lower pressure. You save energy on the fan. 
but more upfront costs to put you know, to the duct. Um, but anyway, 0.17 here per 100 feet. All right, so um, now I'm going to move on to, to duct B, right? So now with this section here, I found out what my pressure loss per 100 feet here is, and I can just go to section B. I've got 20 feet of, uh, let's see, so I take off 1,200, so 4,000 minus 1,200 goes that way, so 800 CFM. So I, now I have 800 CFM, uh, four to, uh, what did I do wrong here? So 4,000 minus 12, oh, it's 2,800. So two, yeah, 2,000 plus 800, so 2,800 is going through B. So I want to size duct B to have the same pressure, 0 0.17, 0 0.17, but now I have 2,800 CFM. So in the blue area, I'd go 2,800 CFM, 0.17, can't see anymore. Looks like this is a 19 inch duct. 18.5, uh, yeah, 18.5. Then you, you know, at some point you have to look at what the available ducts are. The ducts do come in standard diameters. And I, I can't remember what they are offhand. I don't think there's an 18 and a half inch. We may have to go to 20 inches, but I'd have to look to see what the, what the stand. And you can have the sheet metal, you can have it specially made for you on the construction site, but that's that's ex that's an expensive route to go. You always want to try to use off-the-shelf stuff if you can. Um, okay, so uh, that tells me um, that I need 18 and a half inch, and then my velocity is going to be 1450 feet per minute. Uh, so I go and do the same thing for duct C and D. I at each step, I, I, I lop off some CFM because it goes out you know, when, when there's a fork, CFM, some of the CFM goes one way. So duct C, we take, take off 2,000, and we've got 800 CFM left. 800 CFM, keeping the friction constant. Now I've got a, a diameter of 11.5 inches and 1,100 FPM. And, and you just keep going until you you got to the end. And... Uh, so duct B, 13 and a half inches, 1,200 feet per minute. And now we identify the run, well, I, I, sh I should have done, added in these losses first, but I kind of gave away the punchline here. Identify the run, greatest friction loss, ABC, its total length is 110 feet, and often it is, gonna, it is the longest run, but not always, not always. Computer makes this a lot easier than having to do it manually. Uh, but ABC is our critical run here, so we have to size our fan to cover the ABC run. So we're going to sum up the total static pressure in that run, but, and we're going to include the losses from the two fittings, the two elbows and the branching T. Okay, so the, the, uh, for the elbows, we have the equivalent length given is 12 times the diameter. So there's two elbows, and they're in lines that are 21 inches. And uh, so we just calculate with that you know, equivalent length of straight duct, 42 feet, provides the equivalent friction loss to these two elbows. That's a lot of duct. I mean, it kind of shows you what how much loss you have in these uh, fittings and elbows, especially when you turn them at 90 degrees. Um, so now we can calculate the equivalent length of the entire ABC, 20 plus 30 plus 10 plus 20 plus 40, and then the 42 from the two elbows gives us 162 feet. So now we multiply 162 by 0.17 over 100. That's our, our constant friction loss. So we've got 162 feet times 0.17 over 100 gives us 0.275 inches of water. 
is our static loss through the critical run. But we still have one more fitting to take into account. We've got that branching T, and its loss is based on the loss coefficient, or the K factor, which is given. And when we use loss coefficients, um, the, the, the loss is proportional to the coefficient times the velocity head. So whatever that K is, we have to multiply it by the velocity head, which means we have to calculate that velocity head. Um, and this is the, uh, it, the velocity entering the T, which is 1,600 feet per minute in that part of the dot. So there's our, pressure, our, uh, our velocity head. It's 0.16. And then we multiply that by the coefficient. 1.5 gives us 0.24 inches of water. And so we have to add that to our total loss here. So that's what the next line here is. Let's see. We add the T. So there's the 0.275. And then we add the loss from the T, which is 0.24. And then we've got the loss through the diffuser. The final step to make it into the room, we need a little juice there which is 0.15, and that gives us a total of 0.665 inches of water. We've got to, we've got to, our, our, our fan has to overcome that. And now we've got what we need. For the uh, fan calculation, we need the total pressure. The total head is going to be the sum of the static pressure and the velocity pressure. So the static pressure here the velocity pressure, 0 0.160, which is this term here, that's the velocity coming out of the fan. So the fan has to develop that velocity as well as the static pressure. So we add them up at the very end here. 0.665 plus 0.16 gives us 0.83. And uh, and, and, and I stopped there because uh, we didn't go uh, any further. But we could uh, now, if we want to, we can calculate the, the fan power. So the air horsepower would be the head. Sorry, I can never remember what that determine the denominator is anymore. It's what happens when you get older. I just can't remember. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. Because sometimes I, I default to uh, six five three six. Yeah, I just can't rely on my, my no, memory no, no, you're, anymore. You're six six three five six. Give me six three five six. Okay, so our total head now is, uh, to or total pressure is, is I think I, I, I called it in my uh, fan equations here. Um, where did it go? It was 0.83. So I just need to uh, make sure that's inches of water. And then my, uh, my Q, hmm? oh, 4,000 was my total CFM over 6356, and that gives us what? I don't know why I didn't do that anymore. 83 times 4,000 divided by 6356 is, uh, is it 0.522? Seems like it should be more than that. So, it could be more because of the efficiency in real life, correct? Because the brake horsepower would be more. Yeah. Well, it's just uh, I think it's just because these are short, such short runs. Uh, in, in, in the example. <laughs> Yeah. 
20, 30 feet. Yeah, these are these are really short runs of Okay, well that would be the next step. And then if we wanted to factor in the efficiency, the brake horsepower is, is the actual motor size. So this is the, the power on the shaft. The air horsepower is the energy going into the air. But the energy going into the fan, delivered by the motor to the fan, would be the brake horsepower. And that would be the air horsepower divided by the fan efficiency. And fan efficiencies are around 0.5 to 0.7, somewhere in that, in that ballpark. Okay. And then when we get to the fans, um, we choose a fan by comparing our system, picking our, 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 our system, which has a, we have a certain CFM that has to push against a certain static head or, or total head. And then we have to match that up with the manufacturer's pump curve, or fan curve. It's the same thing with pumps, but dealing with fans here. And this is just an example of a pump or a fan curve showing the, the, the total pressure developed by the fan as a function of CFM. And the fan curves all have this similar shape here. This is unique. Uh, this, this is for a, uh, a backward curve fan. Um, it has a character, this characteristic uh, dip here that we want to avoid because what can happen if you're operating, if you're operating in this region here is that for every static pressure or every total pressure point, there are two CFM that will work with that same total pressure. So what will happen is the fan can oscillate back and forth between the two CFM that give the same total pressure. That's called fan surging. And you don't want that. That creates a lot of noise and produces mechanical stresses on the fan. And so we always want to be, when we choose a fan or a pump, we want to be on the downward side of the, of the peak over here. This is uh, cl close to the peak, usually close to the peak efficiency. But we like to be a little bit off. And we like to be in a place where the curve is steep. Because that means that you can, you can vary, you know, the pressure in the system can change without affecting the CFM a whole lot. Because things can happen, people uh, uh, switch dampers on, off, or they, they, they open and close them. Things are constantly happening in a system that causes the, the pressure to vary, and you don't want that to have a, a huge effect on the flow rate of the air, because that's what gives the cooling of the heating. You know, this is what you want. That's what the customer is asking for. So you want to be in a place here where the pressure can vary without affecting this a whole lot. So somewhere to the right of the hump and uh, near where the curve is steep, but also where you, the, the fan or the pump is, is, is operating at relatively high efficiency. As the efficiency changes as you move around the curve here. OK, now this is the system. Uh, curve here. This is showing how our system responds as we change the flow rate through our duct work. How does the pressure change? And every system has its own curve. And you have to develop that before you go to the fan manufacturer pump to choose a, a pump or a fan. Now, did you all do fan curves or pump curves in fluid mechanics? Did, did you do that? I think we did. I think I remember one problem. On an exam that wasn't for a fan or a pump, that was like okay, flow yeah, rate versus it, pressure. I, it, it looks familiar. I think it might have been slightly, I can't remember the properties, but I do remember we were comparing similar similar equipment. Like essentially reading off and saying, you're in this range, so take this value. So I remember that. But yeah. I can't say if it was 
I don't know if we talked about it as in much depth as we're doing now, but I think most of us have at least seen the curve before. Yeah, I always want to just bang my head against the wall because you, know, you look at the fluid mechanics textbook. I mean, they do this since it's, it's at the very end, like the last chapter on turbo machines or something like that. But the very last chapter, they actually talk about practical, you know, real world pumps. The application of it, yes. Yeah, as opposed yeah. to, you know, a bunch of partial differential equations that you know, most of the time we're never going to use out in the field. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, and, and this is, it, it, it's, it's not, Part of the reason it's not covered is it's not hard. It's not, it doesn't take a lot of, uh, you just kind of go through it. It's pretty simple math here. But what you do here is um, when you develop your system curve, well, this just gives us some guidelines as to what we're looking for when we choose the fan. We don't want to have the surging. And, uh, and then this example you know, shows us how to develop our system curve. And uh, so this is a, we've got a, a system that has a total pressure to two inches of water. So we just did the calculation to figure out our total pressure and we found out we need two inches of water and 6,000 CFM is our capacity. What would be the pressure drop, flow rate, efficiency, and power requirement if the fan with the characteristic curve below were installed in the system? Should this fan be selected? So now we've got our, we've done our design, uh, we did our, got our ductwork laid out, figured out what we need, and uh, we call a pump guy and he says, okay, here's what I have. I've got this fan, and uh, here, here's, here's the fan curve. Um, you can see this one doesn't have the little, the little dip here. Um, this is maybe a forward curved fan or the one that doesn't have that little dip over here. So here's how that pump's total pressure varies with the volume flow rate coming through. But you can also see other variables plotted on here. Here is the, uh, here's the power. I think this is the power, yeah. This is the uh, uh, power, horsepower. And usually this is brake horsepower that the fan is gonna require. And this is efficiency, the fan efficiency. So ideally, you want to have the maximum efficiency. In this case, 80%. Wow, that's really good. I mean, if you get your fan working like that, you're going to be saving energy. But you can see that that, that efficiency is going to vary. And I mean, you might get that, but chances are you're not. Usually, we don't get the highest efficiency. It doesn't correspond to the optimal mechanical operating point. It would be nice if it did. Uh, but anyway, okay, this is, manufacturer says, here's my pump curve. Uh, here's my fan curve, and you say, okay, I've got 60, what do I have, 6,500 CFM? I've got 6,500 CFM, and I need 2.3 inches of water. That's my pressure. So we plot that point and we see where it intersects the pump curve, or the fan curve, right here, right there. So if I use this fan in my system, and I turn my system on, it's gonna to go to that operating point. And what, what that tells me is that, okay, I am going to require that much horsepower, so about 2.8 horsepower, and the fan's going to be about 70, 75% efficient or something like that. That's, that's what it's telling me. And I might be happy with that. That might be okay. But what I'm going to want to do before I, I decide on that fan is I want to look at how is this fan going to behave when my system changes a little bit. Because you know I'm not always going to be operating at this point. So people are going to want less air or they're going to shut turn, uh, you know, they're going to play with, around with the system, and I'm not always going to be exactly at that point there, okay? What if I need less CFM? Well, if I need less CFM, the pressure is going to be different. Well, how different? That's what this curve here tells me, and that's what I have to build based off of my system design. And it's easy to do, because all I need to know is one point. 
And we already, we've done our design, we have our point, we've got 6,000 CFM at two inches of water. That's all I need to build my fan curve. That's because there is a relationship between pressure and capacity. Now, where's that stupid equation? Oh, uh, here it is here. So pressure, the, the, the ratio of, the, of, of pressure any two pressures in my system is proportional to the square of the ratio of the CFM, of the CFM capacity. And so if I know I have P1 and Q1, well, what happens if I go to Q2? I can calculate P2. And I can do that for, make a, uh, for a whole set of points, which is what we do here. So that's my design point. Two inches of water at 6,000 CFM. Suppose, really hot day, somebody needs more cool air, so they call for 6,500 CFM. What happens to the pressure in my system? Well, I can calculate that. It's P2 is going to be equal to P1, the square of Q2 over Q1. So the new CFM over the original Square it times the original pressure, and there's my new pressure. So I have a second point I can add to my system curve, 6,500 CFM, 2.3 inches of water. And that's this point here, 6,500. 60, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, we're, uh, we're, it's, it's uh, here, this point here. So it's a little bit above my design point, but now I have a second point. And then I can do a third. How about if we go to uh, 7,000 CFM? What if, what if I need 7,000 CFM? Um, originally 6,000 at two inches of water. What's my new pressure going to be? Well, 2.7 inches. So we've got 2.7 inches over here and 7,000 CFM. And now, you know, we've, we've done the high side. You know, if we go any further, we're gonna go off the chart or be near the chart. Let's now go lower. What if we dial down the CFM to what, 6,000? Let's see what happens if we go to 6,000 CFM. <clears throat> Well, I went, I went lower than that first. I, I went all the way down to 3,000 CFM. So I went down to that point there. So here's my original pressure, my original CFM, and now my new pressure is 0.5. So at 3,000 CFM, I have 0.5 inches of water. And I just keep doing that until I have enough points that I can make a curve like that. And now I can figure out exactly what's going to happen every time I tweak my system. Okay, so that's what I designed for. Now let's say you know uh, somebody that turns off a damper or needs less air. Suddenly we go down to uh, 4,000 cfm. So I'm right there. My system is designed to be there, but now I'm down here. 4,000 cfm. Uh, what, uh, what, what, how is my system going to uh, going to operate? at this point here. Well, what's going to happen if I run my, if I try to run my system at this point here with this fan, what's going to happen is the fan, it's not going to deliver that pressure. My, my system wants that pressure, but because I, I have this manufacturer's fan, it's going to give me this pressure up here. It's going to give me that pressure. And so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to use a damper or something to pull that pressure down. And it's going to give me, uh, it's going to require this power. And it's going to operate at this efficiency. So we're going to go down to about 60% uh, efficiency. Okay? So that's what I have to do. I have to inspect a bunch of different pump, uh, fans and you know, put my system curve over top of them and choose the best one for my application. Okay, now uh, we come to the end of this, and so 
So I've got my, my system curve, and with the fan installed, the flow rate would be about 6,200 CFM, 2.25 inches of water, and 76% efficient, 2.9 horsepower, brake horsepower. At the design point, should I be satisfied with that? And I say here, I don't know. I don't think I would be. And the reason is that even though this fan curve doesn't have that hump, it doesn't have that dip, it still has something here that makes me really uncomfortable. And that is at this operating point, if, if, that, if that total pressure that my system needs, uh, I can have either this CFM, like 1,000 CFM, or 6,500 CFM. Both of those CFMs will give me 2.3 inches of water pressure drop. So there's a risk here that this fan will oscillate between those two CFM. And that's dangerous. I, I don't want that. If I was going to use this fan, I would want this point to be over here somewhere. Not, not up here. The other thing is the slope here is not very great. So, you know, a, a slight changes in the pressure, you know, could cause significant changes in the flow rate going through. So I probably would not choose this fan. Well, I, I, I would not choose this fan. But I, this was just an example. I think that was the fan in the book. It was an easy uh, fan curve just to play with. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Do you explain the oscillation a little more? Because I'm not seeing how it would oscillate. If it's operating at a higher power, why would it oscillate back to a lower power? Uh, you said it would oscillate between those two pressure points. It or it has a chance to. Not yeah. It it not it, it, it depends on several factors, but it may it may or may not oscillate. But it's just that the on the fluid mechanics side of it, there there are two possible solutions that give us that same pressure, and so the physics. Because there are two possible solutions, the, the system will try to deliver those two solutions. So like the control, the control system of it would try to get two different values for pressure? Um, I guess I'm just not, just not picturing how that would how that would that would move. happening on it's, it's like the, the CFM and, and the pressure are, are, are not independent of each other as one changes the other it, it, it is going to change it does, it's not a control system thing it's just that uh, uh, it's just how uh, it, it's just the physics of those of the system um, but there's also friction and inertia that would prevent or try to prevent the system from oscillating, from changing. So the, the, the question is whether the desire to oscillate <laughs> is strong enough to overcome the inertia that the system already has operating, the, the mechanical inertia. Um, I, it's like So you're running into the wind. So if you're running into the wind, or you're, you're moving a vehicle against the wind,
and the, the, the vehicle is the, uh, maybe like an air, like a jet in the jet stream, and the jet is just being carried by the jet stream. So it doesn't, it's not a mechanical intervention, it's the, uh, the, the, the vehicle is just being carried along in the flow. Um, but the vehicle could, uh, you can imagine an airplane and it's being carried in the jet stream and suddenly that vehicle can, you know, it, it, can, it, can, it can increase its speed by 50% and, 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 and still, you know, the equations of motion are still solved. I, yeah, I, I'm sorry I can't explain it any better. <clears throat> Yeah, perhaps if we Google uh, airflow surging, we might be able to see a, a you know, mechanical, a, or an HVAC tech might be able to explain that and with visuals in a way that would make more sense than each other. And it's actually, it's not something that I personally have experienced. I only know it from hearing about it and, and studying it, but I've always, been, I've always avoided it by just not being in a, in a place where it can, it can happen. So I'm not even sure what causes it. Yeah, I, I haven't experienced it starting and you know, an operator intervening to try to correct it. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. I, I know what you mean, though. It is weird. Um, OK. Uh, the, the final part of this just lists some equations that allow us to think about how if we tweak one parameter in the fan, how other parameters would adjust. And uh, these are called uh, affinity equations, or uh, in this case, fan affinity equations. And these just tell us that the variables relate in, in certain ways to each other. Um, flow rate and speed of fan rotation are directly proportional. So if you were to double the, the speed of the fans turning, you would double the amount of CFM you could put through. Okay. Uh, this one tells us the relationship between the, the pressure, the total pressure, and the speed of rotation. So if you were to double the speed of rotation, you would quadruple the pressure, the total pressure in the system. And then this one is relating the power, the brake horsepower, to, uh, to the RPM. This is if you had a constant fan diameter. So the size of the fan was the same as the diameter of the fan. But fans and pumps are, are adjustable. You can swap out fans, fan blades of different diameter or pumps with different impeller sizes. Uh, if we hold the RPM constant and um, we vary the, the diameter, the size of the, the diameter of the fan rotor, um, we get this set of equations here. And I notice here, this V dot, that should be Q. This is because when I went and revised my notes, my uh, last year, the text I used, used V dot instead of Q, and I missed those Vs. But those should be Q. Q2 over Q1, Q2 over Q1 here. Sorry about that, I missed this. Q is volume. Um, some, Sources use Q for volume flow rate. Others use V dot. Both variables are problematic because Q is often heat, right? Heat transfer is Q. And V is velocity. So sometimes volume flow rate is just a difficult variable. Yeah, and then sometimes we, uh, we can swap out fans um, for um, similar fans, and there are equations like this for pumps as well, and this is just showing how different fans that are, they're called homologous, their mechanical design enables them to be swapped out. Um, and, uh, and scale, and these relationships allow you to determine how variations in one fan or how, 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 how the variables on two different fans that are mechanically similar can, can relate to each other. So those are affinity laws and similarity laws. And I don't know, did you see those in fluid mechanics? 
because I think this is also covered at the end, but uh, this is FD, this is uh, definitely FD exam stuff. Actually, pretty much everything here. Now this, um, this would be a PE exam question, having you develop a, a, a power curve for a fan. I don't, you wouldn't see that on the FD exam, but uh, I remember that on the PE exam. But uh, it is likely on the uh, FE exam that you'd be shown a curve like that and just be asked some questions about, about it. At least that, when I do the FE review for fluid mechanics, I have a, a slide that does uh, fluid mechanics or pump mechanics. Yeah, so that's air. And you know what we did with, uh, with air is very similar with, with water. Um, except we're using pumps instead of fans. The, the rest of this just goes over the types of fans. The workhorse in HVAC is a centrifugal fan. And um, the noteworthy feature, it looks like a snail. Um, especially when you, when you look at it from the side here. Um, when you, you put the fluid in, in the center, and it turns it at a right angle. And so you have to think about the design of the system here and make sure that uh, you know, you're, you're going to go in, your duct's coming in like this, it's going to go into the fan, and it's going to come out at right angles. And that can be a problem in some, in some designs. Um, but uh, centrifugal fans are great when you need, uh, you know, a significant amount of pressure. Yeah. You know, big system, you've got lots of friction to overcome. Um, and they are uh, 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 characterized by the, the design of the fan, uh, forward curve, backward curve, or uh, radial, and the way that the fan blades are curved uh, affects the shape of the, of the fan curve. And, um, and then there are axial fans, uh, axial fans are fans that are uh, the air got con it, uh, the, the, the air goes goes through and it just continues in the same direction. So the air continues moving along the axis at which it entered the fan. And those are good when you have large quantities of air, but relatively low static pressures. And then, you know, a type of axial fan that we all know is just a box fan that we use in our homes. And uh, of course, that isn't capable of developing much, uh, much pressure. Um, but that is an axial type of fan. It's called a propeller fan. Um, so there you go, fans, air distribution. And then my uh, little duct uh, guy, this is not very good. I, I, Put this up as a reference for a uh, duct uh, equivalent lengths, but these only apply under restricted conditions if you have 0.1 uh, inches of water per 100 feet or 0.3 and the diameter. Um, kind of limited here, but we have a kind of shows you what these fittings look like. This is for a rectangular duct and then for circular ducts here. And um, see all the different kinds of fittings. You'll know an HVAC engineer, if you go into a if you go into a building and the duct work is exposed, it looks like it's like <laughs> I'm always in here, like looking around. Like, wow, what am I do that? What kind of a fitting is that? And now a lot of buildings expose this. Yeah, like out here you can see the duct work. You can see the pipes that are insulating. That's how you know a geek. You know a geek. But anyway, um, okay, let's take a little break, and then we'll come back and look at water. The, uh, to work through with um, water. Um, I, I was not able to write examples into my notes. <laughs> so we have to we have to do the examples in person.
Everybody have one? And uh, I, I hope we can get through the first example. We probably won't get be able to do the second one, but we'll see how, how far we can go here. Um, all right, so with water, of course we shift from ducts to piping. Now we're going to be looking at piping. Um, and uh, water is very common in HVAC systems. It may not seem like it because in, in household systems or small systems, uh, water is not usually um, a separate system. Um, but when we get into any uh, larger commercial or, or uh, certainly a, a office building or, or a campus, uh, water is a big part of, of the systems. Uh, in a chilled water system, it is the main part that's delivering cooling throughout the building. And uh, so you've got chilled water, it brings cold water out to the spaces, and then the warm water goes back to the chiller. But then we have water that is used as a coolant uh, in the condenser to uh, remove the heat. When the refrigerant condenses, it rejects its heat. There are some air-cooled condensers, but when you get into large HVAC systems, like our campus here, um, air is not sufficient to remove all the heat that's in the refrigerant. You need water. And so uh, cooling water, but we, also, we often have water uh, circuits that are cooling the condenser. Um, water can also uh, be a source of heat as well. If, if a, a, a system has a boiler, as our university does, then the boiler heats water, makes hot water, and then the hot water gets pumped out. So water is pretty common. We got to be able to move that around. Um, I suppose when we move refrigerant as well, and there are HVAC systems called uh, variable refrigerant flow systems that will actually move refrigerant around the building. Instead of the refrigerant just being inside the, the vapor compression, you know, the little area where the refrigerant cycle is located, the refrigerant will actually move out to the point where heating and cooling happens. So you may have to move refrigerant around. That's a different problem that we're not going to talk about here. And that's why we use compressors for that. Uh, but anyway, water, by far the most commonly pumped uh, fluid. Uh, we use pumps. And uh, pipes, of course, uh, we use pipes. And uh, again, we have the problem of what velocity do I use? How, how do I begin to design a piping system? And we start with these uh, rules of thumb for the design. We can look these up. You know, there's a, there's a, a design rule for municipal water systems, for HVAC systems, for boiler feed water systems. But typically in HVAC, Four to eight feet per second is the normal range of velocity. Um, but again, we're, we're trying to, you know, velocity, when, it, when you increase velocity, you increase pressure loss. Uh, it rises exponentially. So you double the velocity, you quadruple the pressure loss. And so trying to you know, minimize velocity, uh, but of course, as you lower the velocity, you need bigger pipes. So there's that cost element there. Um, four to eight feet per second, pressure loss of one to four feet of water per 100 feet of pipe. And 2.5 is now a recommended target for HVAC design, 2.5 feet of water. See now in, in, in air we're talking, we're talking inches of water, right? Because air is, uh, it's not as dense, it's not gonna be as subject to as much friction moving through a system. The, the shear forces are not as great with gases as they are with liquids. So the liquids, much higher pressure drop. Now we're talking feet of water instead of inches. Um, most of uh, HVAC piping is copper or steel. You know, hot water in particular tends to run in copper pipe. Uh, we start to seeing a lot of plastic pipe as well um, for uh, water that is not very hot. Um, and uh, actually, there's a lot of plastic pipes now that will uh, tolerate heat and, uh, and uh, other conditions that uh, not long ago would have been a problem for plastic. Um, so you're seeing more plastic pipe being used. 
Um, plastic has some downsides as well. It's not as mechanically strong, of course, as steel. Um, you have to worry more about how it's gonna be supported. Uh, it needs more supports at more frequent intervals. Um, a concern with pipes in buildings is uh, there's a fire. Uh, plastic often releases toxic fumes, um, and uh, which doesn't, doesn't happen. Yet. But you're still seeing a lot of plastic now. Um, let's see, uh, steel pipes rated by the schedule number, and I think the ones you'll most commonly encounter, schedule 40 and schedule 80. Schedule 40, I think by far the most common. Schedule 80, <laughs> A thicker pipe wall. So for high high pressure applications, schedule E pipe. And that schedule number refers to how thick the wall is. Um, and uh, there's a table here that has some information about um, steel pipe. There's a bigger table in our textbook. And um, the size the size here is, is that we typically say like two inch schedule 40 pipe, that's the nominal size. Um, but then there is a, um, an, out, an outside diameter and an inside diameter that corresponds to the nominal size, wall thickness and uh, flow area given here if we need that information. Um, of course, we put fittings in just as we do with, uh, with ducts. There are different types of valves, and I would urge you to uh, explore this link to see what these different kinds of valves look like. It's a wide variety of them. They're kind of fun to play around with. Uh, and uh, each has a different behavior in a, uh, when you put it in the system and a different use. Generally, gate valves are for open and close. That's all. Open, close. And if you want to throttle, you know, adjust things, globe and angle valves, butterfly valves tend to be better for that. Check valves are valves that prevent backflow. So if you, you want to make sure something doesn't come backwards in the line. Um, for all pipes and fittings, we can calculate the, the friction head loss using the darcy weisbach equation. Of course, we can do that with air as well. But in practice, we rarely use that because there are other shortcuts that we can use. Um, now, figuring out the pressure, the, the friction loss in a pipe, um, the textbook has graphs that we can use. So you, you know the, uh, the velocity and the size, for example, you can see what the pressure loss is, just as you can with, uh, with air. Um, I don't like those graphs. They're hard to read, especially with my eyesight the way it is. Um, I like tables. That the tables are better, or using the Darcy Weisbach equation. But I have reference books, you know, mechanical engineering books that have uh, vast tables of pressure loss for every imaginable pipe. And that's what I'll go to. But in the absence of that, I'll go to this link here for uh, if I'm working with steel pipe. And I would urge you to use this resource um, Schedule 40 Steel Pipe. I can go to whatever size I have, if it's a one inch pipe, and I can, uh, whatever capacity, now in with air, we talk about CFM is our capacity, but with water, uh, we use GPM primarily in, in our uh, IP units. So if I have a one inch pipe and I'm running at 2.5 GPM, I can come across and see what my velocity is gonna be. 0.92 feet per second, and my pressure drop will be 0.24 or 0.55 feet of water per 100 feet of pipe. So I, this is a, to me, a better way, an easier way to find out what your pressure drop is through uh, whatever pipe that you're, you're using. Um, and if you're designing to a particular pressure drop, let's say I'm designing to 2.9 or around three feet of water per 100 feet of pipe, then I can just come and see, okay, well, what, how much, how much water can I put through this pipe? I can come over and see, oh, I can run this at uh, 4.8 GPM. And when I have 4.8 GPM, the water's gonna be moving at 1.72 feet per second. So that's got handy to use when you're uh, dealing with water. Um, 
Then there's another table for copper tubes, if you want to work with copper tubes. Now we look at fittings. And uh, again, you know, we can use equivalent lengths for the friction loss for fittings. Uh, but I think it's more common to use the K factors, the, the loss coefficients. And uh, they're, they're easier to use for water and liquids because there just aren't as many variables involved. So we have uh, that basically the K, the K factors are organized by whether the, the pipe is threaded or flanged. The flanged pipe, by the most common type of, of pipe when you have maybe three inches or four inches of larger pipe in industrial applications where you join the sections by these flanges with compression bolts. But there are also uh, threaded pipes, threaded fittings that screw together. Generally, a lot more awkward, difficult to mess with when you have to take things apart. Um, you have to be able to unscrew the pipes, the fittings. But you see this a lot for smaller, you know, two, inch, two inches and below. So you can look up whatever uh, the fitting is by pipe diameter. And uh, for example, the 90 degree standard elbow K factor for two inch threaded steel pipe of just 1.0. And the friction loss would be the uh, K times the velocity head, V squared over 2G. And generally what we do is we just, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, for each section of the pipeline that's at the same velocity, we'll sum the K factors for all the fittings, just add them up, multiply by the velocity head, and that will be the loss, the head loss for our fittings. And then once we have the, for our pipe, our straight pipe and our fittings, we add them up, just like we did with the dots to get the total losses friction losses uh, in, the, in the pipe system. Then we come to our pump, and we want to be able to translate our friction head loss to a pressure loss, and, uh, and eventually to uh, power, pumping power. So to get from friction head loss to pressure loss, or drop in pressure, multiply by the specific weight Okay, which is 62.4 for water at standard conditions. Uh, and then if we can uh, write out our, our, uh, our friction head, or our, now our pump head is, we can solve the extended Bernoulli equation for the pump head, and which has the friction head uh, in it. And this is really the equation that we're solving when we are sizing our pump, figuring out the how much energy our pump has to put in, not only to overcome the friction loss, but also to climb an elevation, to gain any velocity, and to increase the pressure. Okay. So you might hear pump head referred to as total dynamic head, or TDH, as some people call it. Uh, and this is how much energy, it's just like the total pressure in the the duct system. It's, it's how much energy the pump has to add to move the water. And then the power, the pumping power, is the pump head multiplied by the mass flow rate times G. Or more often we have the Q, we have the GPM or the volume flow rate, multiplied by that by density, that's the same as the mass flow rate. times the, uh, the head here. And um, if we replace the density with specific gravity, we can, we can calculate it with reference to water at standard conditions. G. 
missing a G. Here. Yeah, because the, uh, row Q is is in dot, and I think I still I need a G over here to make this uh, equivalent. So I'm going to have to go back and look at that. Uh, but nevertheless, we don't generally use this equation in HVAC. Um, we use more convenient forms, which are actually shown over here in this table. Um, when we're using water, well, actually, you don't even have to be using water here because this has specific gravity. If you have specific gravity, then the equation, you can use any fluid. Um, so uh, when we calculate the water horsepower, the calculation is the same as air horsepower. We're multiplying head, or your know, total pressure, times capacity pressure times flow rate. And then uh, this is the conversion factor that gets us horsepower. Okay? And if it's just water at 68 degrees, specific gravity is one. Okay? But if it's hot water, you know, water at 150 degrees, you know, this might be 0.98 or something like that. If it's gasoline, you know, or oil, it might be 0.75. So we can use a fluid other than water if we need to. Um, so these are various ways that you can calculate power, horsepower, if, uh, depending on which variables you know. You need to know two uh, of this list of variables, any two of them, and you compare them to calculate the water horsepower. So this is if you know the delta P and PSI, multiplied by Q and GPM, divided by 1714 horsepower. So it's all equivalent ways of getting horsepower. So most of the time, this one is the one that our HVAC design um, gives us. And that gives us water horsepower or hydraulic horsepower. That's the energy going directly into the fluid. And, just, and then like with fans, the brake horsepower, that's the horsepower that's actually going into the pump, the, 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 the shaft from the motor is conveying into uh, and turning pump and power. Um, so the pump efficiency, water horsepower over brake horsepower. Uh, and then actually we could juxtapose this with the fan uh, unit as well. Motors come in standard sizes. Um, so if you calculate a you know, brake horsepower that, let's say you, you need nine horsepower, you're going to go with a 10 horsepower motor. You're always going to go up. You're going to choose the motor higher, the next one higher up than your design calculation calls for. Um, but this is the range of choices that we have for standard NEMA motors, nameplate horsepower, or brake horsepower ratings. And, um, and then this, the net positive suction head is something we have to be, uh, we have to be aware of because of the chance, um, you know, a fan or a pump, you know, it's, it's developing pressure on its output, but it has suction on the input, which means you're drawing a vacuum. The input side is below atmospheric pressure, and if you go too far below atmospheric pressure, you can cause the liquid to vaporize. And uh, the, 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 the quantity we need to be mindful of is the net positive suction head. This is the minimum. Well, there's an actual net positive suction head at the pump inlet, and we can calculate that based on the, uh, the, the pressure at the, uh, going into the pump, the elevation head uh, on the discharge side, minus the uh, friction, minus the vapor pressure, this is the head, or the vapor head, of the liquid, and that's specific to the liquid, we have to calculate this and compare it to the required suction head. And that would be NPSH with a little r, and we get that from the pump manufacturer. And that, the manufacturer tells us you, you can't let your NPSH fall below this or it will vaporize and destroy the pump or damage the pump. And uh, so that's something you really need to be uh, take into account. It usually only it comes up, it's usually a problem if you're 
you're trying to, uh, if your pump is up a lot higher than the source that you're pumping from. So let's say my pump is here. Well, let's say my, my pump is on the roof and I'm, I'm pulling water up from the ground level. So the suction side of the pump is quite far below the pump inlet. So that, 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 that fluid has a long way to go just to get into the in, inlet to the pump. That's where you're most in danger of, of the pressure gets so low that the fluid will start to, to vaporize. It's, just, it's not a problem if you're, you don't really have elevation gain or the input to the pump is at the same elevation as the pump. But anyway, so uh, pumps like fans come in varieties. We've got centrifugal pumps. These are the workhorses. Just like a centrifugal fan, um, the fluid comes in to the, to the center, uh, to the center and color, and it's flung outward. You develop centripetal force, and uh, that, that force uh, accelerates the liquid uh, around the ring here, and then out the discharge. And, uh, and then there are also axial flow pumps that work uh, in, on, in the same axis of motion of the fluid. Um, and just as with fans, we have uh, pump curves. They look very similar. The head starts out high at no flow, and then it comes down as the flow uh, increases. And we size the pump in a way similar to the way we size the fan, is we try to size it you know, somewhere over here. Um, you're trying to, to you know, get into a region where you have a, a stable flow near the maximum efficiency of the, of the, of the pump motor um, horsepower. And often you'll have the net positive suction head will be shown as well. And then often these curves will be, uh, you'll have a family of curves uh, for different speeds of operation or different impeller sizes. Like this is a pump curve, head versus capacity, for different impeller sizes or diameter. This would be the diameter of the, of the rotor that's turning. So seven inch down to five inches, and each one has a curve, and then the power curves are laid on top of that, and the efficiencies. And oh boy, can we start the problem? And, uh, and then just as we can develop a, a system curve for our fan and our air, we can develop a system curve for our pump and our, our water. And this is how we do it. And again, the difference here, remember with the duct, pressure is equal to, or, or is proportional to the square of the capacity of the CFM. But with a liquid, we also have to consider the elevation change. The elevation head is, is, is significant if there's only any elevation change plus a constant times the square of the, of the fluid. And we can use that equation to develop a, a curve for our system just as we did with our ducts. And also, as we did with air and ducts, we have affinity laws that relate the uh, development variables to each other for a single pump and and then for a family of related pumps that scale we have the similarity laws here and that's really all we need to know about pumps to be able to design them. and so the handout there are two problems there and I will uh, uh, we'll go over those problems, those examples that uh, apply what we just went over here, and we'll do that the first thing on Wednesday. Yeah. Any questions? Or? It's kind of a crash review of fluid mechanics.